Hi guys, uh, Stephen from Cosmophoto here and I just wanted to give you all a bit of a crash course in Soviet cameras. Um, I got into Soviet cameras about 20 years ago when I was uh, first really getting into film photography uh, and I, I sort of took this big deep dive into like the wonderful world of the cameras from the USSR. Uh, during the Cold War, um, the USSR's camera industry was actually the second biggest in the world next to Japan's. So I wanted to take you through a few of the more common models. Um, perhaps if you're sort of interested in maybe trying a Soviet camera or two and you don't really know which one to try first, this is a pretty good range which shows like the major manufacturers and some of the, the more reliable and easy to shoot with designs. The Soviet Union actually had six big camera brands and they were Balamo, which was in the Belarusian capital Minsk, Fed in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, Kiev in what's now the capital of uh, Ukraine, Kiev, Lomo, uh, based in what was Leningrad and is now St. Petersburg, and Zenit and Zorki, uh, that were both part of the same giant camera works just outside of Moscow. So this is the Zenit E, which is uh, probably the most famous Soviet SLR. Um, more Zenit E's were made than any other SLR in history something like 8 million of them from 1965 to 1982, which is pretty much around the time autofocus cameras came out. And every Zenit E shares pretty much the same uh, features. It has uh, shutter speeds from 1 30th of a second up to 1 500th, which is pretty much all you need if you're just walking around taking pictures on holiday or doing street photography. It also has a, a bulb mode, which uh, will keep the camera shutter open as long as you keep the shutter button depressed. That can be useful for nighttime photographs or landscapes. Uh, you have a little uh, exposure meter here. A great beginner's camera. So these were sold uh, all around Western Europe and the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, right down to like places like Australia and Brazil during the Cold War. And, uh, Lenses for this mount were made all over the world, like countless varieties, some of them very cheap, some of them really expensive. Uh, and a lot of those lenses are really, really good, including some of the, the Soviet lenses that were, were made by KMZ, which made the Zenit, or various other uh, lens manufacturers. So the Zenit TTL is one of the SLRs which was uh, really influenced by the Zenit E. It's pretty much the same camera, except it comes with one like major feature, which is uh, a meter, uh, which you can read in the viewfinder, uh, just like you can with a DSLR or a more modern film camera. The great thing about uh, these cameras is that universal lens mount just offers up the, the huge variety of screw mount lenses. I mean, uh, hundreds, hundreds of different lenses made all around the world. Next to the Zenit SLRs, the, the best known Soviet cameras are the Leica copies. Uh, and most of these were made by two companies, uh, Fed, um, which was in what's now the Ukraine in Kharkiv, and Zorki, which was the rangefinder brand of Krasnogorsk Mechanski Zavod, a big camera maker just outside of Moscow. So what we have here is a, a pretty typical Fed rangefinder from um, the 1950s, 1960s. It's a Fed 2. It takes the Leica screw mount, which is the old uh, Leica lens mount from sort of before the 1950s. It's got a really nice balance to it. It just feels good in the hand. Uh, it's got a bit like the Zenit, just the shutter speeds that you need, usually uh, 130 up to 1 500th. Uh, it has a bottom loading system, so you turn these keys here. Oh, and actually open it because it's got film in it. Uh, open the keys and the whole back comes off. But it's certainly uh, a lot easier to load than the early Leica cameras, which had quite a fiddly film loading process. Um, 
Fed made a whole family of uh, these rangefinder cameras from the Fed 1 up to the Fed 5. Um, just the Fed 2 alone, about 1.6 million of these were made. Uh, so they're not hard to get hold of. Um, they were simple, pretty well made as well. Uh, there's actually quite a few devotees uh, that came from the, the Leica rangefinder end of things who, who, who say that the Fed 2 is a, a pretty good camera. So uh, KMZ had their own rangefinder brand as well, uh, Zorki, and Zorki uh, is a Russian word which kind of translates to uh, far-sighted or Hawkeye. Uh, and there were various uh, Zorki cameras made um, from the Zorki 1 up to the Zorki 6. Um, and a really uh, good example of late model Zorkis uh, is this one here, which is the Zorki 4K. Um, not as wide a uh, rangefinder focusing, so not as accurate. Um, some would say as the the Fed, but I've used uh, the 4K a lot for street photography. It's a really great usable camera. So this is sort of 20 years uh, more recent than than the Fed 2. There aren't as many Zorki 4Ks as there are Fed 2s, but it's by no means a rare camera. More than half a million of these were made, so you can buy one of these with a lens for 40 or 50 pounds. Um, like the Fed, no meter, so it doesn't need any kind of batteries. Uh, everything's mechanical, every shutter speed. Load film and you're good to go. Lomo, uh, they weren't famous for their rangefinders, but they were famous for cameras like uh, the Smino range. Smino is a Russian word which uh, translates roughly as change. And uh, the Sminas were essentially like compact style cameras, mostly made of plastic. Uh, and many, many millions of these were made from the 1950s up until the 1990s. Uh, and this is one of the better examples, um, the Smina symbol, which is from the 1970s. Uh, it's sometimes called a toy camera, but it's actually much better quality than that. It has a, a glass lens, it's not a plastic lens like you might find on a Diana or a Holger. This is a really nice, usable, compact camera has a really nice movement and shutter movement. It's got that great sort of crunch to it. Um, millions of these cameras were made. Uh, just one model of the, the Smina range, the Smina 8 and the Smina 8M. I've written about them on Cosmophoto. Uh, 22 million of those were made. So uh, these are probably the most common 35 mil cameras you can find anywhere on earth. They don't have a rangefinder, they certainly don't have autofocus. They use uh, instead this idea called scale focusing. So uh, they helpfully have these little cartoons um, as you move the, the lens from close to infinity and they, they give you an idea of like are you group, shooting a, a group portrait while well, have it at this setting. And it's actually you know a pretty good reminder um, when you shoot this uh, camera at like f8, f11, it's actually pretty sharp. Uh, the, the rolls I've shot on this camera I've been really, really impressed with. So Bellamo in Minsk also made uh, a family of cameras um, very like this Mina. Uh, and one of the most usable of their range is a camera called the Bellamo Silhouette Electro, uh, which is a, a scale focusing camera which also has auto exposure. This is probably the most top of the range of Bellamo's um, compact cameras. It's the Silhouette Electro which was made in the 1970s and 80s. It's actually got an auto exposure system. So you just choose the uh, aperture here and the camera will choose the shutter speed. It's got a, a battery operated meter. Um, I bought this a few years ago for eight pounds at a camera fair. I've uh, been really impressed. It's got that sort of Lomo look to its shots. Uh, it works really well with uh, cross-process slide film or, or cheap expired print film. Um, it's kind of chunky. It's got a bit of heft to it, um, but it's, uh, it's really easy to use once you, you get the hang of the, the scale focusing using these uh, 
sort of suggested distances. Um, and again, like you can pick these things up for a, a tenner, um, just pop some batteries in, and it's a, it's a really fun way to shoot film. So you can't talk about Soviet cameras without mentioning this little guy, the Lomo LCA, or Lomo Compact Automat. Um, this is a little compact zone focus uh, 35mm camera made in what was then Leningrad in the 1980s. This was um, copied from a little Japanese uh, compact camera in the early 1980s um, uh, at the orders of the then Deputy Minister of Defence who wanted something that could be handed out to uh, apparatchiks at Communist Party conferences. This is the camera I turn to when I'm uh, stuck in a bit of a rut. It's just so much fun to shoot with. The Lomography movement had the idea of, uh, you know, don't think, just shoot. And this is the perfect camera for it. You just shoot away uh, using like cross-process slide or expired print film. And you just get these wonderful, like impressionistic images. Um, everywhere I go when I'm traveling around the world, uh, I, I make sure I pack a Lomo with me because they're, they're just such a great little camera to have with you when you're you know, walking around the streets. Lomo didn't just make plastic compacts, they also made medium format cameras. And this is probably the most famous of their cameras, the Lubatel, um, which is a Russian word which translates as amateur. Lubatel is uh, a really long running family of TLR cameras, twin lens reflex cameras, um, you know, similar to the Rollerflex. So you basically look through the top. Uh, I can see John here behind the camera. Um, and it has two lenses. This is uh, the one that translates the view into the screen I'm looking at. And this one is the picture taking lens. Um, these are probably the cheapest way to get into quality medium format. Uh, you can pick up a, a Lubitel for 20 pounds. Um, millions of these were made. Um, from the 1950s up to the 1990s. Uh, in fact, Lomography still makes a version of this to this day, um, which is based on this exact model, the Universal. It's the last um, Lubitel model to be made in the Soviet Union. What's great about these cameras is they have a really good quality glass lens. It's not a plastic lens like you find in the Holger. Um, it's a triplet lens. Um, so pretty much exactly the same lens as you would find in a Smina 35mm camera. It's a great travel camera. I've taken this to Malta and uh, Romania and all sorts of other places. The great thing with TLRs is you can be sort of fairly unobtrusive when you're taking pictures. It doesn't look like you're taking a picture of someone. And finally, we have here uh, the tank or the beast from the east or the Kiev 60, uh, which is a medium format 6x6 camera, which shoots uh, 120 film. And this was uh, Kiev's um, answer to the Pentagon 6, which was a, an East German medium format camera made from the 1950s. It uses the same lens mount as the Pentagon 6. What that means is it gives you access to all these wonderful lenses um, made in East Germany. Um, by Carl Zeiss Jena. Uh, they're really, really good. Why choose this over the Lubitel? Well, you've got a, a great metering prism. That's a TTL camera, like shooting an SLR. So if you've come from DSLRs or, or film SLRs, it's probably a little easier to use. So that's a bit of a crash course in Soviet cameras. Um, a few of them more available um, and easy to use models. Believe me, there's a whole crazy world of Soviet cameras, um, really interesting, innovative designs um, that's like well worth exploring. These are some of the more common models. They're pretty easy to find, they're pretty reliable and they don't cost a lot of money to buy. So that means you have more money to spend on film and processing.